everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live. This is going to be all about all the recent changes at Etsy. So we are so glad you're here. I'm Abby Glassenberg. Hi. Hi, I'm Danielle Spurge from the Merriweather Council. Thank you, Abby, for having me. Of course. So periodically, Danielle and I like to get together and talk a little bit about um, Etsy because both of us are well, longtime Etsy sellers as well as Etsy followers and maybe Etsy enthusiasts or at least enthusiasts for Etsy sellers. Yeah. Um, and so we are, uh, last time we talked, we talked about Pattern, which was Etsy's or is still Etsy's um, standalone website, e-commerce website, and it had just launched and we had a really nice discussion about Pattern. And this time we're talking about a whole slew of changes because there's just been crazy Etsy news recently. So, so much happening, so much happening. Yeah, I feel like we need to process it a little bit. Um, so some of the things that we are going to talk about, just to give you a preview, um, we're going to start by talking about Etsy Studio. So that'll be up first. Um, and then we're going to move into talking about Etsy Payments. And then after Etsy Payments, I have a little notepad next to me here, so I'm very organized. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the new Shop Manager. And then we're going to end by just um, commenting a little bit about the management changes at Etsy. And one thing that I want to make clear first is that we do not work for Etsy. And anything that we're saying is just our opinion from our own perspective, but has nothing to do with Etsy as a corporation or something that they're endorsing. This is just me and Danielle chit-chatting about our perspectives. Yes, absolutely. No um, affiliation. <laughs> yes, we are not affiliated with Etsy, except to be Etsy sellers, and right. that's about it. <laughs> right. So uh, also, we really encourage people to ask questions and say hello. Um, you can ask a question or say hi in the comments, and we will respond um, as we can on screen and certainly afterward, too. And if you want to just start by saying um, if you're an Etsy seller and what you sell on Etsy, that would be great. We'll start there, and we'll um, kind of go from there. So, all right, um, let's dive in and talk a little bit about Etsy Studio. So this launched maybe two weeks ago. Um, do you want to kind of give us the, the broad overhead? Like, what is Etsy Studio? Of course. Okay. So I feel like there was so much time between when they announced Etsy Studio was coming and when it actually was live for looking at. Um, and there was a lot of like turmoil right in between. But Etsy Studio is basically um, a second Etsy platform for create for selling um, supplies and kits and DIY and also where they are providing tutorials and how to's and demos. Um, of course, they have their Instagram channel as well, lots of videos. So um, it's, it's great. You know, it sounds great, at least for supply sellers, anybody who sells supplies, you don't have to do anything extra to show up there. Um, so on the surface, it sounds great if you sell supplies or kits or patterns. Um, and I don't, so I can't speak to that. But um, I know some finished product sellers were concerned that Etsy was just kind of undercutting them by teaching people how to make the things that other people are selling. So I can understand that as well. Although personally, I do think it's two different audiences all the time. Usually the person who's going to make something is completely not the person who's going to buy something finished at, you know, a premium price. But um, it looks lovely. And it seems like a nice way for Etsy to sort of broaden its horizons. And obviously, Etsy is a, is a business as well. So we can see how this benefits them. And I can totally understand why they would want to be doing this. And they do seem to be doing a good job at what they're trying to do. Yeah. And so um, that, that's that point about having the DIY side by side with the listing. So that's obviously really new for Etsy, right? Mm -hmm. In the Etsy marketplace we've grown to know and love these past 10 years, there is no DIY content. It's just these listings and that's it. And so now we've got almost kind of like Pinterest side by side with these listings. So it'll tell you how to make a pom-pom garland. And then at the bottom, there is a sort of recommended listings that you might need to make the pom-pom garland. And 
then there's even more listings after that. So if you didn't want the first one that they're recommending, like this yarn, then, you know, the algorithm kind of built out all these other yarns that would also be suitable. Um, and same thing with this scissors or whatever else to make yeah. this garland. Um, and then there's an, also a neat button that's like, add everything to your cart. So that one first recommended item, you can just say, okay, well, Etsy built that out for me. I'll just add it all to my cart. Interestingly, when I did that for the pom-pom garland, it was $72 worth of materials in my car. I mean, I didn't buy it, but it was like, oh my wow, goodness. interesting. That's a pretty, that's, yeah. I mean, you could probably buy it for less than that. Um, I mean, it, that's another reason why it seems awesome if you are the supplier, um, because it makes it so easy for people to be like, oh, I like that. I want to make it. Here's the stuff. Good. Great. Done. Um, so if you're a supplier, it seems like it's great. Um, but that's, they're probably picking those initial materials, like the ones that they're actually recommending and not the ones that the algorithm kind of just picks up at the end, probably picking those for a variety of reasons and price is probably one of them. So, um, that was interesting. Right. For them as well, <laughs> there on that count as well. And a few other things I noticed. So I know on Etsy itself, something that sellers really advocated for for years was to have more branding, right? We wanted more ways to differentiate our shops so that you didn't say you bought it on Etsy, you said you bought it from Danielle or you bought it from Abby. And one of the things that we got through, I think, a lot of that back and forth with Etsy was this really nice big banner at the right. top of our Etsy site, which I really like. I've used it. I like it. I did notice on Studio there is no branding. As far as I can tell, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're a studio seller, and I sell supplies. So my studio shop is there, and I went through all 72 listings and added attributes and getting ready for it to open. Right. Which is frankly, a lot of work. Um, but anyway, I did that and because I wanted to come up and search and everything and have the full experience. Sure. Um, but definitely, if you read a DIY on Etsy Studio about how to make a baby rattle and then added my baby rattles, rattle inserts to your cart, you know, right. because they recommended them or something like that, you would not say, oh, Abby's baby rattle inserts, yay. Yes. It would be like, I bought it on Etsy Studio. Right, right, right. Which I think is, I honestly do appreciate what they've done on standard regular Etsy with the branding, but I don't think it necessarily changed anything about the way people talk about what they purchased on Etsy. I mean, I even say I got it on Etsy, you know, Definitely. which is bad and I'm sorry, but <laughs> unless it's someone who I'm like very familiar with already, I'm much more likely to, just, oh, I got it on, especially when you're talking to someone who you don't know so well either, which is how a lot of these things go down where it's like you're wearing something or you have something on you that's like, oh, I love that. You're not going to be like, oh, I bought it from my friend who I met from wherever and I saw them on, they have an Etsy. Like, you're not going to go into this whole thing. You're just going to be like, oh, yeah, I got it on Etsy because that's, you know, entry level conversation. So it's nice that they gave us the branding and I definitely don't think it hurt. Um, it could only help. But yeah, I think definitely on studio, you're really really don't stand a chance at all with that. that way. Right. And in that way, it's really a competitor to Michael's to a degree. Right. right. And so, um, you know, one of the things they, and they even marketed that way. I felt like leading up to the launch, there was a feeling like uh, Michael's has 33,000 SKUs on their website and we're going to launch with 8 million. Right. Yes. Like that was sort of part of the, that you know, was. The hype, and which is an interesting thing to say, and, and uh, Michael's CEO has said basically like they don't really believe you can sell low cost craft items online successfully. It's not really part of their strategy so much. Mm. And this is a bet on the other side of that, which is an, an interesting thing to think about. But right. uh, um, you know, Etsy's whole indie craft ethos is like the anti Michael. And now we are like competing, competing with Michaels, which is like really we've come a 
a long way. I'm not sure right. in the direction, but. Right. And that's kind of like, the more you talk about it, the more you're like, hmm, like, yeah, I can see where this is like problematic in some ways, but still, I think ultimately, you know, people's main goal, they're like, I want to make sales. I want to make sales. And if you're, if you're a supplier, this really only benefits you in that way. Um, and I don't know if you have any like insider knowledge on this, but do you think that this has something to do with why they initiated that horrible user experience cart buy all at one time thing because of add all the items you need from various shops to make this one project? That is very likely, and I think they may be, I mean, at least they've said, this is the, this is what we're talking about is sort of the um, multi-shop checkout, checkout, where yeah. you could add an item from my shop and from Danielle's shop and from seven other shop on payment, right. whereas previously you would add an item shop and then just go through and pay me and then pay Danielle and then like pay each person separately and one of the things that was good about that is that buyers were able to see our different policies as well as our different shipping charges and the way when you have multi shop checkout um, then you don't see that and so some buyers are caught by surprise by the shipping charges and not being able to see that breakdown did they do that in order to prep for etsy studio because of that add to cart where you get everything for the project i'm guessing perhaps yes. but i don't know yeah yeah, yeah i mean sure. it certainly seems like that would make sense at least yeah but, um and do you yeah, think, overall do you think this is like a um do you think this spells a future in which they break vintage out? So where we have Etsy as handmade, which is something sellers have really asked for for years, which is to say, take us back to our roots, make Etsy a handmade marketplace where everything's handmade. Granted, I think that's a slippery slope because what is the definition of exactly handmade? If you take a t-shirt and you add a rhinestone, is it handmade? I mean, you can go down and you can't be the police of that because that's crazy, crazy labor intensive. So, but be that as it may, that where we have Etsy is handmade, we have studio for supplies, and we have Etsy vintage for vintage. Is that is that next? I mean, they they haven't really indicated necessarily that they would be pulling supplies from regular Etsy, have they? They haven't, but that's a good question as well. Because I would, I mean, it makes sense that they would you know like lo like logically it makes sense to be like oh they might do that with vintage but are they going to pull both of those from regular etsy too like i can't really see that happening because it's just been like so established that you can buy all of these things there um and also like i don't know if it would just like make sense ultimately like it makes sense for them to spread out but i don't know if it makes sense for them to break them apart completely like that so I don't know. It's interesting yeah. to think about because then people would be like, oh, it's just another eBay. Why isn't it behaving like eBay, it, especially with the vintage? Right. It's really not supposed to be like eBay. It's just supposed to be dedicated vintage. So I don't know. I mean, right. it's it would be a major. So we would have Etsy Studio as a Michael's competitor and we would have this you know, supposed some sort of like Etsy vintage that would compete with eBay. And it's like, do you really want to go head to head with eBay on that? Perhaps not. Um, so anyway, it's just something to yeah. consider. Like what is, what is the big plan? And we don't have access to that. So we don't know. Right. We can right. see mine. Yeah. 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 It is nice to know that there are theoretically a lot of possibilities for what could happen next in, in the sense that it's comforting to know like, well, Etsy's not like making moves that make it look like they're going under necessarily, but um, I mean, some people would probably disagree with that. I don't think Etsy's going under. No, I, I don't. Think Etsy think. has some mismanagement, but I don't think it's going under. So we are definitely yeah. going to talk about that, but let's move on to talking about Etsy payments. Okay. Okay. Since that was sort of the other big piece of this. Um, yeah. So... Um, Etsy Payments essentially is a new name for Direct Checkout. And Direct Checkout was what they used to be called, where basically people could use their credit card directly on Etsy to pay for things. 
instead of having to go to PayPal and use PayPal to pay for things. Um, so um, basically people would have the choice, uh, sellers would have the choice to enable direct checkout or not. Um, and up until maybe a year ago, after that, everyone who joined Etsy as a seller had to have direct checkout. It was no longer a choice. You could still have PayPal, but you had to enable direct checkout. So there are some people who were longtime sellers who basically said, I don't want direct checkout, and they never enabled it. Um, and they've just been using PayPal for their customers as a way for them to pay. And all of that is going to change because it, it was um, May 17th. They've extended the deadline, which was yesterday. They've extended the deadline to May 30th of 2017 now. But by then, everybody has to enable direct checkout, which is now called Etsy Payments. Um, those people who had standalone PayPal will get to keep it for yeah. at least a year or so. But talking to a guy on, at customer service a few weeks ago, he said he feels that in, in 2018, that's going to go away. So that means that, you know, buyers, don't get me wrong, they still have the opportunity to use PayPal, but those PayPal payments are processed by Etsy. They are not processed by PayPal. So Etsy's built basically its own payment processor. And there's 10 different ways to pay, Apple Pay, Android Pay, MasterCard, Visa, all these different options. Right. But the thing with it that's important to notice is that in order for this to happen, you have to, as a seller, hook your Etsy shop up with your bank account because all the money that gets processed through Etsy payments gets deposited in your bank account. You can set up how frequently you want those deposits. It can be every day if you have, I think, a $25 amount in there waiting to be deposited. Um, you don't have to wait a week. You can do it every day, every three days, whatever you want. You can set it up automatically. You can do it manually. But it's going to your bank account. And so some people have really expressed uh, disappointment about that. I can understand that. I personally buy everything online that I possibly can with PayPal. It's easy for me. I always have a balance there. It just makes sense. And it's, I don't know my credit card information off the top of my head, and I'm certainly not going to save it in my phone. So a lot of times if, you know, I'm buying something, that's just the quickest way to get it done. I know that on Etsy, you can save your card info in there and I definitely do think I have I mean I think you I guess you have to have at least one thing in there but um you know for buying stuff PayPal is just so easy and for years this is a little off topic but Squarespace wasn't syncing with PayPal and I always told my students I'm like I can't imagine not accepting PayPal like how do you run an online business without accepting PayPal that's absurd to me like 99% of the, the money I make online is processed through PayPal. So, um, you know, I and I, too, always use PayPal. So I can totally understand why people would be, like, annoyed that their PayPal balance is now significantly reduced because of having to send their Etsy money to their bank account. And is also, PayPal is a big deal, like, going to make me not want to uh, sell on Etsy anymore? No, but I can understand... That PayPal that. instant, it's got that instant, right? Like as soon as somebody pays you, that money is available to you. So if you sent me a PayPal payment right now for $9, I would have $9 to spend on something on Amazon immediately. Right. And typically with a bank account, there can be a day or two delay, right? If you send me $9 and even if I go ahead and withdraw that money immediately and put it in my, you know, from Etsy payments and put it in my bank account, it's not going to really be available to me until maybe Monday. Right. And, you know, that's disappointing. Yeah. And I do. I, I do think that that's a downfall to the whole thing. I don't know if it's enough of a downfall that I'd be like, I give up on Etsy entirely. But I definitely get that. Um, so that kind of sucks. <laughs> I mean, right now I have the standalone PayPal because that's what I've, I've had for so long. And I've always accepted direct checkout. Like as soon as it was available, I was like, heck, yeah, that's great. And I've never had a problem with it, save for when there were those blackout periods where it just wasn't working. Um, people couldn't use it. However, I think at the time, um, my, my shop, 
was on vacation at the time that that happened. But I know like if it was open, I would have had a problem with that. Like I would have been annoyed by that. So this so is going un- back to, um, to World Pay when World yes. Pay last year yeah. had an outage. And um, subsequent to that, though, it's important to know that Etsy signed on with another company similar to World Pay that provides basically um, the same services. So it's almost like a second layer of protection, if that makes sense. So that has oh. outages, there's a backup. So they have taken that precaution. And I mean, some sellers have also sort of said they don't trust Etsy as much as they trust PayPal um, to process payments, which was an interesting thing because I have not had a security breach or problem with Etsy. And, you know, the, I've been selling on Etsy since 2005, and I have not had any sort of financial insecurity experience right. through Etsy. So I do trust Etsy actually when it comes to my bank account. And I and I also will say that I think for some sellers, this is a push to open a bank account. Um, and I think there's, there's a contingent of Etsy sellers who use PayPal as their bank. And although I can see why that's easy, PayPal is not a bank. It is a money transferring company. And their full deposits is not actually completely FDIC insured. So it's actually better to have a bank account that's separate and for your business, also for bookkeeping and tax purposes where things are not commingled. So it kind of is pushing the very hobby seller into becoming professionalized, which is an, uh, I actually think is a good move, but I can understand the feeling of not wanting that to happen. Yeah, I mean, I can totally understand wanting to be able to decide for yourself which of these options, especially because it was previously up to you and now suddenly it's not. So I totally get that. I do like the idea that people are encouraged now or like almost forced to create a bank account, like you said, sort of legitimize their business in that way. And I will say, even as recently as this morning, I had an issue with, um, not really an issue, but something that I would have liked to speak to someone at PayPal on the phone about and could not um last night like they don't have they don't have 24 hour anything to help you with your money (laughs) like like bank of america would or whatever yeah like you can call somebody at the bank you know most banks and speak to someone somewhere at any time of the day but not such is not the case with paypal so and actually, such is not the case with Stripe either, but that's another story. And such is not the case with Etsy. So at Etsy, Absolutely true, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of right. that part, the fact that you can't always be speaking with a human about your money kind of makes me uncomfortable, but ultimately I do trust them enough. Like you said, I've never had any serious issues with like the transfer of funds from Etsy to my bank account. And I don't feel any insecurity about linking those two or anything like, I mean, that's pretty standard is to have a direct deposit from somewhere at some point in your life. So I don't have a problem with that, but I do understand that people would like to have the option and the immediate funding. So. Right. Exactly. Yeah. On the flip side, I understand it from Etsy's perspective. They want to have control over what's going on on their site as, you know, their own business and that they want it to be sort of cohesive across the board, no matter what you're buying or where you're buying it from, you're having the same checkout experience. Um, Exactly. And I also think that, you know, Etsy's direct checkout now known as Etsy payments is one of Etsy's seller services and Getting sellers to sign up for seller services is a big part of the way that Etsy makes money. So, you know, shipping labels is one way Etsy makes money. Direct checkout is one way Etsy makes money. Um, Promoted listings is one way Etsy makes money. Pattern is one way Etsy makes money. So each of these different things is a way for Etsy to make money. And so Previously, I think I have the statistic here, something like um, 51% of Etsy sellers used at, by at the end of 2016 used at least one um, seller service. So either shipping labels or direct checkout or one thing. 
Well, now, except for those sellers who are in countries where Etsy payments is not going to be enabled because their financial system does not make it feasible. Um, but the rest of us, which is something like 90 something percent of sellers, you know, in all right. the rest of those countries, basically are going to have to use a seller service, right? Direct checkout is a seller service. So that number, 51%, is going to jump up to something like 90% or more where all of us are using a seller service. So that's, uh, to me, that seems like a way to, um, you know, <laughs> profit, right. increase profits, I guess. No, I mean, it's smart for them. Um, and I mean, honestly, I feel like it's a trade-off. The ease of using Etsy and the immense benefits of using Etsy, like you have to pay for that in some capacity and you don't pay it in listing fees. So <laughs> there has to be some kind of exchange, some sort of transaction, a trade off. Um, people would be very hard pressed to experience the things they experience on Etsy elsewhere on their own. So very that's a great way of putting it. And I think very, very difficult to Right. And I think as the web has developed, um, that's only become more true. Even though we have many more options, we can open a big cartel shop, a Squarespace shop, a Shopify shop, and there's tons of other ways, plus other indie marketplaces that are available to you. But as you said, to replicate the experience that you can have on Etsy proves very and increasingly, I think, difficult because what Etsy has is traffic, trust, easy user experience with so many positives that to yeah. me, the fees are well worth it. And I would challenge somebody who says no to open a Shopify shop and give it a year side by side with your Etsy shop and do that comparison of costs and benefits. Yeah, I mean, I know people who are able to like definitely like strike out on their own and make it, um, but I think sometimes they forget that Etsy sort of got them started. <laughs> you know, without that, it would have been much harder. And awesome that they're able to sustain without Etsy or, you know, majority on their own. But I, I think that it just doesn't even make sense to like be like, I'm off Etsy because of that, <laughs> like because of whatever, unless you have like a significant issue depending on your location or maybe I have heard some people say there's location issues depending on where you, you are and whatever. But for Americans, you know, the vast majority of Americans, Europeans, I think it's fine. I haven't heard anything majorly upsetting from any of those jurisdictions. So. And I will say that, um, I so I saw patterns and supplies on Etsy. A third of all of those sales, of all, all my total sales of patterns and supplies comes from Etsy. The other two thirds come from my shop, but that one third I literally do no work for. It just walks in the door, and I'm very <laughs> grateful for that third. So I just yeah, of course. that. All right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about the shop manager. Okay. Um, and um, let's see if I can put that up here. Okay. I'm not sure if I can, but um, so, oh, let's see. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Um, so the shop manager, I don't know a ton about this. Um, I just sort of experimented with it a little bit, but maybe you want to give us the broad overview of what this shop manager is. Sure. So, I mean, Etsy does this a lot where they like change things. And really, it's just like recompartmentalize. Um, everything is basically the same. It's just differently organized and possibly more aesthetically pleasing for to look at. It's a little bit you see more of a bigger picture at once on your dashboard, um, which is kind of nice. I don't particularly love it, honestly. I think it's like too much clicking to get to the next thing that you want to see. Like when you go to orders, it brings up another sidebar and then you have to select wholesale or retail or whatever. And I'm like, just bring, like, I don't just bring me to the orders. Like it just seems like a lot of clicking. I don't know, but um, I don't mind it. I don't love it. I'm just kind of like whatever about it. I'll get used to it. But um, 
the activity feed is sort of on the sidebar. Then in the middle, you have like a general stats and like quick look at your convos. Your unread convos show up first, which is kind of nice. And then you've got all your other stuff on the other sidebar. So, and then, yeah, the stats is, it's like unread convos and stats, a little snapshot. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to have a bigger picture all at once, but some people I think feel overwhelmed by that as well, so. I've heard that it's better on desktop than it is on mobile. Yes, I think um, I would agree with that. Is buggy. I haven't tried it on mobile. I don't actually manage my Etsy shop on my phone, but people who yeah. do have said that they've had problems on mobile. Um, yeah. The mobile app in general seems to have a lot of people complaining quite frequently. <laughs> So um, I don't know if it's necessarily because of Shop Manager, but I know in my group, like people are always complaining about the mobile app. Like there's always something for someone going wrong. So, and a lot of that probably depends on an individual's update status and settings and whatever, but the app definitely seems a little glitchy. <laughs> and this overall. is the seller app. This is not the app, oh, yes. app that buyers and customers look at. This is the seller yes. only app. Yeah, the, uh, the white logo. Right, app. exactly, exactly, yeah. that seems a little bit. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, um, Chad, this was in a statement, I think that Chad had written, and he said about the shop manager, that the shop manager showcases the breadth and depth of our services and tools in one convenient place, which we believe can help encourage seller service adoption. So I thought that was interesting too. And if you do look at it through that lens, you'll see in the shop manager, all the services are there. So yes. you can Patterns, get a one, like click the plus sign and add a pattern shop, you know, right. so it kind of allows you to almost shop for seller services and see it all in one place. And if that is one of their goals, then this is working towards that end. It's true. You can see if you had a pattern site, it would be linked right there. When you have wholesale, it's linked right there. And is it true that studio is as well? It is. Yes. So that's nice that, and I guess smart again for them. I mean, exactly. everybody's always looking out for number one, right? <laughs> so I get it. I get it. But um, Every now and then they do stuff that feels like a bigger change than it actually is. Like everyone freaks out and they're like, where did everything go? What's happening? And then three days later it's like, oh yeah, it's actually pretty, it's fine. And I think that's endemic to running a business online. That the way that running a business online works now and forever is that technology has to constantly change and shift and be updated because the way that we use the web changes, all kinds of things about it are always constantly going to shift. And if adopting um, to you know new technology, new ways of doing things and adapting to those shifts bothers you a lot, then running an online business is going to bother you a lot, you know, because you're going to open Instagram tomorrow and things are going to be different. There's going to be a new box and a new icon and a new functionality and what happened to my old functionality and I miss it. And that's just the nature of the web. Um, and so, and the nature of running an online business and you have to get used to it. Just can't get too attached to anything. It seems like so. Um, I mean, even like, when you do have autonomy, like, you know, when you update WordPress and things get moved around or when Shopify updates something and things get moved, it's not like major, but it's like, oh, I still don't have control over that either. Like, no matter what, That's true. everybody's always using somebody's service unless you're like, like, no one is that independent. So it's just not possible. Um, so, yeah, it's just the, the nature of the beast, I guess. But again... In the sense of Etsy, the trade-off, you know, what are you getting in exchange for tolerating these minor changes to aesthetics, basically? Um, right. And I so. think you're getting a lot. Anita had a question. She wanted to know um, the new stats, they are separating views from visits. And what do we think about that? I actually hadn't noticed that. I, like I said, me and the shop manager have not spent so much time together because I spent almost no time on my Etsy shop. Um, so maybe you've noticed that. 
I have noticed it mostly because people ask me about it when to go look at it. I've been sort of like MIA from Etsy for a, a week at least. But um, yeah, views is now visits which I think they probably should have made a bigger deal about the change, notifying people because people were like, my views plummeted. <laughs> and it's like, not really. What actually you're seeing now is per person, you're seeing the person, not all of the actions that person took. So if I come to your shop at um, Abby and I click through every single one of your listings, that's one visit. Like I see. 72 views or whatever. So it's actually more accurate, but less of a stroke to my ego. Correct. Because <laughs> you're just yes. Danielle looking at all my items versus 72 Danielle's looking at my items. I do think it would be nice if you could more easily see all of the views right now. Like you can only see, and again, I haven't spent too much time with it either because it's so new, but you can't see all of the views like for the whole month yet or whatever. Like when you change the setting on the top to like this week, this month, whatever, it doesn't change the views. I so, see. As okay. far as I have seen, at least I, I'm assuming they'll update that because that's like kind of stupid and annoying. But um, for right now, it, it does make people feel like they've been abandoned. Like, their shop like looks like a little bit more desperate, I think, on their side because th those numbers are so much lower. The first numbers that you see, but ultimately, I'm not curious, like, not that much said there, like around morale, and especially for newer sellers, around helping newer sellers to feel successful. Because and there's been talk around is search um, sort of favoring new sellers or not? You know, that's not been necessarily certified yet if that's true or not but sort of a lot of suspicion around it but sort of the idea that a new seller does need to feel successful there's nothing more motivating than success and you're more likely to stick around create new listings put more time and energy into your shop if you feel like people are viewing it people are clicking on it even if you're not making a ton of sales right away but people are actually at least seeing it and that you're not just like shouting into a void so when you have that graph go down like this and there's like less explanation about the difference between visits and views, I can see sellers being like, oh my God, there's nobody even looking. What's the point? And then they go away, which is not what Etsy wants. I mean, I do think Etsy right. wants you to succeed. They, they want your fees. They want you to make money. Um, they want you to stick around, renew your listings, et cetera. So, right. um, yeah, I mean, on the flip side, too, you don't need a ton of views, like, or visits, whatever. Like, you can have one visit and, like, a $200 order. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I totally agree that it looks less good than it did before because everybody likes that hit of, like, oh, a thousand people saw my shop today. Or, like, a thousand views where it's not a thousand people at all. It's, like, 50 people who saw it. But, yeah. Right. And some of those people are seeing it and – they're looking at it for other reasons. They're not looking oh, at it they want to buy it. I mean, I look at things on Etsy all the time but with no intention of buying. I'm doing research. I'm learning about something. I'm getting a feel for us an aesthetic. I mean, there's all different reasons why people look at you at listings and never purchase with no right. intention of purchasing. So, yeah. All right. Are you ready to move on to our last um, topic, which is management yeah. changes? Okay. Yeah, give it to me. <laughs> cool. All right. So last week we had kind of a huge news story which broke um, seemingly out of the blue, which was that um, CEO Chad Dickerson was being fired by the board. He also was chairman of the board. Um, and they let go also the CTO as well as 8% um, of the staff. And um, so we have now have Josh Silverman, who is formerly of American Express, Skype, and Evite, who is now – the CEO of Etsy, um, he was on the board and now he's the CEO. And um, so a lot of people are sort of conjecturing, why did this happen? What caused it? What, obviously there must have been some big concern. Um, and then also what does it mean for the future of Etsy? Etsy is a publicly traded company, went public, uh, what was that, a year and a half ago or something like that? And what does that mean? Is this a consequence of that? Is it going to go private again? Are we going to see a new buyer? So there's so many you know, things that we don't know, obviously. Um, but it was certainly jarring. And I think for me, at least, 
somewhat disconcerting. So how are you feeling about the changes in management? Well, I'll just preface this by saying I don't know enough about corporate America and how it works to know whether this is normal, not normal, good, bad. Um, so all I can say is, I guess, you know, there's a time for everything and every, you know, everything must change like we were just talking about. I don't necessarily like have strong enough feelings about Chad Dickerson to be like, no, Chad, don't leave us. But um and I don't necessarily have strong enough feelings about Josh Silverman to know whether I care enough about him either. But I don't mind that it happened in the sense that if if there's going to be like fresh changes or like new stuff to look forward to, I don't really I know I saw in your uh, newsletter yesterday that it could go private and sell to like Walmart, which I don't really love the idea of, but I like, I don't know enough about it to have like a strong enough opinion yet. I don't think. I think it's not going to go private right away. That's my feeling just from reading a little bit more since that newsletter. I think, you know, obviously nobody can predict the future. I certainly am not privy to financial statements or something like that. But from what I can tell, I think it's going to be a little bit more of a longer term shift. Um, I think that the, there was obviously a deep concern that meant Chad was going to have to go um, in the board's view. I don't think it had to do with anything regarding, you know, Chad's morality or something like that. I don't think he was stealing or anything like that. Yeah, the yeah, people no. that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to a few people who work at Etsy, they deeply admired him, felt that um, he had created a corporate culture that really respected women and respected the environment. And I therefore admired him and was and was actually sad to see him go. Um, I think perhaps there were cost overruns. Um, to me, it seems like the building, when they invested $40 million to outfit that building in Brooklyn and make it like LEED certified and... Um, yeah super swank with, you know, barn wood and all this awesome stuff. Um, I think it's expensive. And I think also giving, treating employees so well, like giving people six month parental leave is amazing. Totally. Yeah. That. It's also really expensive. And, you know, even bigger companies like Google don't offer such generous packages. And, you know, I think Chad really valued that humanity and at the same time, I do wonder whether they could really afford it. Um, that's so, true. Yeah. So that's maybe some concern there. I hope that I don't know anything about Josh Silverman except for a very little bit I've read about him. I hope that he yeah. still values humanity. Um, I understand some of those things are going to need to be trimmed. But my hope is that, you know, we can – retain some of the parts of handmade that went into making Etsy's corporate culture special, mm -hmm. that it doesn't become, you know, like what happened to Mod Cloth where it gets sold to Walmart. So yes, I know, I know. Um, I did read parts of his q and I don't know if you had a chance to look at it. Summerman's in the forums. I did read it. I read the whole thing. Yes. Oh, wow. You did more than I, I did. did. I spent many hours reading that. Yes. Did you, did you find, uh, like, well, how did you feel about it? Cause I, I only skimmed it. So there's that, but some people felt like he was dodging questions and I'm like, well, of course people felt like that. And of course that's how it kind of has to be. He's not going to be like, well, here's all of our disclosures that I'm not really supposed to tell anybody about. Like, obviously there are limits to what he's able to say and what he's not able to say. Also, it was like day three on the job. So can't expect too much from this poor guy right now, but um, it sounded like the parts that we could count on him for like his vision, although I'm sure he's, you know, made it sound as good as possible. They sounded agreeable. Um, to what I think most sellers would want, which is, he said, his primary goal is to get more traffic to your shop. Who can argue with that? Okay. I don't know by what means that's going to happen, but. I think that, um, you know, I think perhaps it was a mistake to pop in the forum so early and mm -hmm. do a Q&A, a written Q&A. Um, first of all, it's very easy to make it, 
it's very easy for people to get the impression that the answers were pre-written, especially since you had to submit your questions in advance and then the most popular questions were upvoted. And so if you only saw certain questions and then also had time to write can or a staff person had time to write a canned response, they took several pictures of him with the staff person in the conference room to show that they were actually doing it live. Um, Again, though, I think that Etsy sellers are extremely hard to please oh, and maybe sure. harder to please than he understood. Um, and I think you potentially make more enemies than friends by doing it that way. I think perhaps doing something. Do you remember when they changed the definition of handmade and they had a live press conference and they had sellers in the audience? It was like on a stage and it was yeah. broadcast and I live tweeted it. And um, I found that to be really effective because you did have sellers who obviously are like local to Brooklyn or whatever, who were in the audience and who stood up to have our question. And they were like, I don't think so. This is bad what you're doing, you know, and, and they had to like respond, you know, there, right. there they were on stage, the engineers and right. being like, well, no here's dodging. why, you know, we right. shoot you, right? here's why. And like seeing their faces and their voices, I think it could have been done that way instead of this. I think he thought it was going to be like, awesome, everyone's awesome. Like, I don't think you can please Etsy sellers like that in a Q&A on the forums. I mean, are the, are the forums ever, everything is awesome? Like, right. I mean, truly, they sent him in there unprepared, I guess, like, throw him to the wolves almost, but that was to be expected. I mean, to be fair. Right. So. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't know that that was the right. It, it, they handled it the best they could with having, you know, pre-approved questions and all of that. But I still think I, I'm not really sure it gave people uh, confidence or hope. I think it was more of like, a, that was lame, but what do you expect kind of right. thing? Yeah, I don't know if we could have expected as much as people were from him at that particular point in time. So yeah, exactly. So We'll just have to see. I mean, that's right. That's why I always tell people, like, autonomy is king here. Like, if you don't like it, you need to have a backup plan. Well, let's end on that note, actually, which is okay. to say, so we're not in control, right? You and I, this whole conversation has really been based on our impressions, our informed opinions, but we are not, obviously, at all in control of what happens to Etsy. And so... What do we do from here, knowing that anything could happen? You know, we and we we cannot predict the future. It could be small tweaks, growth, increased visits, views, sales. It could be a sale to Michaels or Party City next week. There's no way for us to know. All of those things have been put forth. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm personally sticking around. I love Etsy. I'm proud to have been on the platform since, you know, for all this entire run since Etsy was in beta. I'm not going anywhere, mostly so that I can ride ride every wave and see how it goes. But yep. certainly, um, I am. I as I said earlier, I'm not depending on Etsy for all of my income and of my shop sales. It's one third of the of the pie um, for the things I sell on Etsy. I sell a third of them on. Uh, on Etsy. That's where a third of the income comes from. So what about you? Do you feel like what would be the advice for people knowing the uncertainty of the future? I always tell people that Etsy is a tool and that's it. That's all you can expect Etsy to do for you is to help you um, as far as you are as good as using it. Like you have to, you have to use it in whatever way is you know, applicable to you and don't depend on it for anything. Don't get attached to it. If people are like so concerned with what's happening on Etsy, they they especially need to be building something elsewhere. Etsy is just like for no better example at hand right now, Instagram, where you don't you you don't just build your Instagram for the sake of building your Instagram. You don't just build your Etsy for the sake of building your Etsy. Instagram and Etsy should both be helping you build something larger, which is your business. 
as it exists off Etsy. You would never just be like, oh, my business only exists on Instagram. Like the way that people say like, oh, I, I mean, that's totally fine if people only want to sell on Etsy, but like, just be realistic about like, is that true? Is that really what you only want? Because if this goes away, what's go like, are you going to be okay with that? Like you need to just be realistic about your expectations of something that you don't own and that you pay very little to use. Um, I mean, all I expect from Etsy is that it functions like it, it accepts money. I get my money, the end, like that's what I expect from Etsy. And then I just work to understand how it works and then build my shop around that, which is not necessarily something I would be doing too much of if I didn't see the huge benefit of it. So and to me, that huge benefit comes through customer acquisition. So mm -hmm. the way that I see my Etsy shop is my Etsy shop is a form of advertising. Those fees Absolutely. are my advertising fees, which mm -hmm. is to say people go on Etsy. They're searching for something to sew for a new baby. They randomly come upon my baby lovey pattern. They purchase it. I yep. send them an email thanking them, sending them a coupon code and asking them to join my list. The second third, fourth purchase that that person makes comes from my online shop that I host on my WordPress site. So that that person right. becomes Abby's customer and not Etsy's customer. But right. thank you Etsy right. for hiring that customer. It's great for lead generation. It's great for customer acquisition. And I feel really grateful to Etsy for providing that service to me for a very low cost. And yes. it's very easy. So uh, I'm around. Yep. That's the only way to do it, really. I mean, I like to think of all of my Etsy listings as very low cost ads that they can be doing work for me while I'm doing other work and set it and forget it. <laughs> Absolutely. Amen to that. So, Danielle, where can we find you and join your group and sort of get more involved in what you have to offer online? Yeah, so I'm at MerryweatherCouncil.com and I'll, I'll go back in the comments and type it in there. Um, and my Facebook group is at clhl.club. That's the short link. It'll get you there. It stands for Creative Life, Happy Life. <laughs> Super. Excellent. And I'm Abby Glassenberg, and you can join Craft Industry Alliance, which is my trade organization that I co-founded with Kristen Link that tells you all kinds of information, not just about Etsy, but about everything having to do with um, crafting and the business side of craft, which is what I love. So thank you so much, Danielle, for joining me, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye. Okay, bye, everybody.